Paul Butterfield playing at Woodstock all those years ago. Looking at that, you can either be inspired or you can feel like getting the old Marine Band, putting it back in the box and just giving up. The trouble with the diatonic mouth harp is that it's so damned easy to play that there's a danger of getting stuck on that comfortable first rung of the learning ladder and not going any further. That was the case with me until I discovered Adam Gussell's fine series of lessons and became moved to pick up the instrument again and get practicing. Oh, we love you didn't get to hear much blues growing up in 50s England. The radio had an embargo on recorded music, which was severely limited and featured mainly ballad artists like K-Star. The first artist to really have an impact on me was Johnny Ray. What I didn't realise at the time was that stars such as these were mainly doing pop versions of either country or blues or doo-wop songs. Rock and roll was starting to make an impact. Looking at this picture of my bedroom back then, you can see Little Richard next to Dean Martin. But the magazine cover was devoted to Lonnie Donegan. In England, Lonnie was the true link between blues and rock music, and his influence was colossal. His albums started to take over the record collection. You make me Frank, feel Ella so and Dean dominated the gramophone. You make However, my dad's so 78s included artists as diverse as Eartha Kitt, Fats Waller, Glenn Miller and I Red Norvo. But it was the sound of Jimmy Rogers, the legendary singing brakeman, that stood out and had the most impact for me. I told him once or twice to quit playing cards and shooting dice. He's in the jailhouse now. It wasn't until much later that I discovered the blues harmonica on the BBC Radio Arts Channel. Those first sounds of Sonny Terry hooping and hollering was revolutionary to me as Elvis Presley a few years previously. From that point on, I tried to track down any blues records I could get my hands on, mostly country blues and jug band music. A favourite at that time was the Gus Cannon Jug Stompers, featuring the harmonica of Noah Lewis. At this time I was still too young to go to jazz clubs, and so I was unaware that the traditional jazz horns were slowly being taken over by bluesmen such as Alexis Corner. The Marquee Club in Oxford Street was starting to attract younger blues fans at this time and soon the likes of Mick Jagger and Jack Bruce were sitting in with the old guard. Come the mid-60s, anyone with 10 shillings to spare could buy a harmonica and convince themselves that they could play the blues. The Yardbirds were a sensation at the marquee, although Keith Ralph's playing left a lot to be desired in my opinion. Why don't you hurry home? Why don't you hurry home? Blues boom was truly in full flow by now, and stars such as Sonny Boy Williamson and Howlin' Wolf were coming over with concert packages such as the American Folk Blues Festival and the Blues and Gospel Caravan. For less than a pound, you could even squeeze in to see them at small clubs like the Marquee. British groups continued playing the blues with varying degrees of success.
17, it was the summer of 64, and things were really kicking off in London. We were going to the Marquee or the Flamingo every week, and of course, we had to form our own group. I bought myself an Echo Super Vamper harmonica, which cost about 8.6, which is about 90 cents. Somebody showed me how to play Country Line Special by Cyril Davis, and I was away. Back then we had so much confidence. We must have made a right racket, but we didn't care. I most probably sounded something like this. I could fool some of the people some of the time, but I just couldn't fool myself. And when I came across these guys, the game was up. It was another 40 years before I picked up the harmonica again. Adam Gussell has shown that by diligently applying oneself and listening carefully to the, the many great harp players that are about these days, one can maybe, just maybe, really play the blues.